Welcome to IVF This, Greatest Hits Volume 3, Infertility Trauma Part 2, Where Do We Go From Here? Welcome to IVF This. I'm your host, Emily Ginn. After 10 years of primary and secondary infertility due to both male and female factor infertility, I am now the mother to three beautiful miracles. I am married to my favorite person in the world. I'm a social worker, a life coach, and an IVF warrior. I'm here to teach you how to manage your mind and emotions during your IVF journey, to break free from anxiety and regain control of your life, even in the midst of infertility. I'm gonna teach you how to say IVF this to how we think about, talk about, and experience infertility. Let's go. Hello, 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 my beautiful friends. We are now, at this point, past New Year's. It is 2023 now, folks. I can't even, I can't even begin to fathom what is happening (laughs) for us all. Just knowing it's 2023, something just doesn't sit right in my soul. Anyway, here we are, off to a new year. Last week was Greatest Hits Volume 2, and it was the first part of this infertility trauma. Now, Greatest Hits, if you're not familiar, is like a reimagining or revisiting of previous episodes, episodes that occurred early on in the podcast and have probably fallen to the very bottom of your playlist. These are episodes that I believe are really important, and they're episodes that are previously pretty popular. And so we're talking about infertility trauma part two, which is, okay, now we spent last week, the previous episode, understanding how trauma and infertility can be linked. Not everything is trauma, right? We want to understand that. We want to know that. But if you feel like maybe you've experienced some infertility trauma, and trauma, again, Cliff's notes from last week, is anything that overwhelms your ability to cope. Like That is the clinical definition of trauma. This week, we're going to break down ways to help you kind of process that trauma, to help you move through that trauma. When we talk about trauma and processing trauma, the only way out is through. And so today I talk a lot about that, and I hope you find this very, very, very beneficial. And above all, I want you to be super compassionate to yourself. All right, my friends, I hope you enjoy. I'll talk to you soon. Hello, my loves, and welcome back to the podcast. I'm recording this right before I take a few days off. I've been pretty go, go, go over the last several months, getting my business officially launched and getting this podcast off the ground, so I'm ready for a little bit of downtime with my guys. We don't really have anything planned. It's more like a staycation because, you know, COVID in 2020, but I'm so excited. I hope you all are doing so well. Now, this is the second episode of a two-parter I'm doing on infertility trauma. So if you haven't listened to episode five yet, stop this one and listen to that one first. I think the most fundamental disservice we do to ourselves during infertility is to not recognize or acknowledge our trauma. Most of us are not aware that what we have experienced or are experiencing is trauma which is why I spent an entire episode breaking it down. So if you haven't done it already, go check out episode five first and then come back here. Since we are talking about something as important as trauma, I would be completely remiss if I did not call out a very important caveat to this topic. If you are someone that is not functioning, if you cannot get out of bed, take care of your basic needs, eating, bathing, changing your clothes, if you can't get to work or you're crying uncontrollably, or most importantly, you are having thoughts about harming yourself or someone else, stop this podcast right now and call your doctor. It can be your primary care doctor, a general practitioner, your OBGYN, or even 911, but this is not the podcast episode for you until you can get back to a basic level of functioning. Work with your doctor and find a mental health professional, a psychologist, a clinical social worker, a licensed professional counselor, or licensed marriage family therapist to help you get back to functioning. If this is you, I love you and you're not alone. Please reach out for help. 
Now, I want to make sure we go back to a few takeaways from the last episode just to remind you. The first is that trauma responses are a normal response to abnormal events. There is nothing wrong with you. Your brain and body are trying to make sense of the incomprehensible. That's why trauma responses are involuntary. It's a very instinctive thing that your brain and body do to protect you. You didn't do anything wrong. This is what your brain does when it's exposed to trauma. All it means is that you have a human brain. The second thing is that trauma is very individual. It's very person-specific. That's why there is no objective measure for what qualifies or does not qualify for trauma. No one can tell you what you have experienced is not trauma. Well, I, I mean, they can tell you because anyone can say anything they want to, but it doesn't make it true just because they said it. If it's true for you, then it's true for you. Full stop. And the third thing is that trauma changes your perception, your perception of yourself and your perception of the world. That's just what trauma does. Trauma is the unexpected, the uncontrollable, the unpredictable, and the unchangeable. Once trauma has happened in our lives, we cannot go back and change it. The timeline of our existence is permanently impacted And that impact has an effect on how we see the world. But it doesn't mean that life has to stop there. Or that it has to stay there. We do get better. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. So the first thing I want to talk about is the importance of acknowledging and naming your trauma. Author Karen Gross says of trauma, if you cannot name it, you cannot tame it. And if you cannot tame it, you cannot frame it. I think this is a beautiful phrase, highlighting the importance of acknowledging, naming, and owning your trauma. I talked about in the previous episode how many of us don't equate our infertility and IVF experiences as trauma. I didn't. Not for years. I experienced several trauma responses and symptoms related to trauma, but it wasn't until the last few years that I really named it that, that I saw it for what it was. This is so incredibly common. We have a very sensationalized view of trauma that has been curated by the media and film and television industry. That is the typical lens through which we view trauma, how we perceive trauma. But trauma is often more insidious than that. It's less in your face than that. It's one of the big reasons it can be so difficult to recognize your own trauma. The compounded trauma of infertility doesn't scream in your face, I am trauma. Now, I'm not saying there aren't some horrific cases that I have heard from women all around the world, unspeakable circumstances of loss and complications and medical errors leading to infertility. They are out there and they will bring you to your knees. Those are the things we give ourselves permission to believe is trauma. Those are the things we can accept as trauma. So why not the other? Why not the accumulation of micro-traumas we experience over years of infertility? Why don't we let ourselves believe or acknowledge the trauma? I think there are a couple of reasons. It's hard to recognize compounded trauma or trauma responses when you're the one that's in the middle of it. A big component of compounded trauma is that at some point in your journey, you begin to believe the lie that your behaviors and feelings are just what you can expect from this journey, that it's just who you are now. But it's not true. The anger, Sadness, hopelessness, agitation, fear, anxiety, all of it, those are trauma responses. They are an involuntary protective mechanism created by your brain to try to help you stay safe. You can't see the forest for the trees. When 
I think back when I was in the depths of my infertility, it was like I had fallen into a hole. A hole that was deep. There was no light I could see. I couldn't discern the walls from the floor from the sky above me. My brain told me there was no light. My brain told me there was no way out. My brain told me there was no sky above me, that it was all dark. But it was a lie. There is a sky above us. There is light. We just have to know what direction to look. The other thing is that no one wants to admit that they're experiencing or have experienced trauma. There is certainly much more awareness over the past decade than ever before, but it's still a lot of stigma that's attached to it. Admitting you have experienced trauma can be one of the hardest admissions of your life. Sometimes we tell ourselves that what we have experienced wasn't trauma. Or maybe that by acknowledging trauma, we make it mean we didn't cope well enough. Sometimes people believe that they deserve what they are experiencing. Victims to their experience. Believing themselves to be weak or broken. Sometimes admitting trauma means that they will have to look at themselves. The denial of trauma absolves you of any responsibility or ownership over your feelings and actions because it's much easier to look at the things outside of us and the role they play in our lives. Where do you go with your trauma? Upon learning about compounded trauma, my clients will ask the question, how do I move forward? That is the question that I live and breathe for. The beginning of their healing starts with the tiniest of baby steps, coming to the realization that they might actually be traumatized and that the world may not be the dark, fearful, overwhelming, and dread-filled place that we have assumed it had to be. That's the first step. Awareness. We have to name it. We call our trauma into the light. By acknowledging the experience and calling it what it is, you can start to understand how and how much of your trauma response is driven by your thinking. Again, I cannot say this enough. These are normal reactions to abnormal circumstances. But I'm going to offer a few other things as well. The first one is mindfulness. Now that can look like a lot of different things. Breath work, journaling, meditation. One of the most important things allowing your feelings. I'll go into depth with this in a future episode, but this is such an important aspect to healing. Allowing yourself the space and compassion to feel whatever comes up. We are so eager to push away the uncomfortable feelings, trying to force ourselves to feel better, but your body will tell you what it needs. It's pretty remarkable that way. Listen to your body. Allow yourself to feel your feelings. Another aspect is self-care. One of the first things I want to tell you is don't isolate. It's a very normal response to trauma, but it can make it worse. There is a difference between alone time and isolation. I think taking time for yourself is a big part of self-care, but isolation is not. An important aspect of not isolating is understanding that you don't have to talk about your trauma if you don't want to. Just don't be alone so much of the time. And I'm not suggesting that you go out with friends every day and spend time with family most days of the week. Striking a healthy balance of rest and alone time without isolating is very important. And that balance is very individual. Things like nutrition and sleep are so vital to your recovery. And rest is another important aspect. Now, rest and sleep are different. Rest involves the whole being, not just your body. So rest can look like daily gratitudes, 
taking a time out from social media, planning or taking a vacation, naps, avoiding stimulants like alcohol, drugs, and dare I say caffeine. And my favorite aspect of self-care, compassion. Extending yourself grace and compassion is so huge. I could scream it from the rooftops. Recognizing that none of this is your fault and that there is nothing wrong with you. Exercise compassion when you get angry or irritable. That understanding that this is part of the process. The more a compassion you can extend for yourself, the more you heal. Exercise and movement is crucial. Trauma responses come with large doses of hormones like adrenaline and cortisol. Exercise and movement can help burn off those hormones while also releasing one of the feel-good hormones, endorphins. I'm remembering that scene from Legally Blonde where Elle Woods talks about endorphins and how endorphins make you happy and happy people don't kill their husbands. They just don't. I love that movie. Anyway, there is evidence to suggest that rhythmic exercises that engage both arms and legs work best, like walking, running, swimming, or dancing. Yoga is also an amazing option because it also incorporates mindfulness. Try to get some exercise, even if you're just taking a walk around your block, for about 30 minutes a day, most days of the week. If you can't fit it into a block, Do three 10-minute exercises or walks during the day. And lastly, hire a professional. This can be a coach like me or a mental health professional. Either of us can help you walk through your healing journey or both. Both of us can help you if that's what you feel is the most appropriate option. And you're the one that gets to decide that. No one else. I included the caveat at the beginning of this episode, and I want to make sure I go over it again. Please seek help and support and assistance right now if you are having trouble functioning at home or work, suffering from severe anxiety, depression, fear that limits your ability to function in a day-to-day setting, experiencing nightmares, flashbacks, or terrifying memories, or you're using drugs and alcohol to excess to feel better. If this is you or you're interested in getting a counselor or therapist, I would strongly suggest someone with specialties in EMDR, which is eye movement desensitization reprocessing, CBT, which is cognitive behavioral therapy, CPT, which is cognitive processing therapy, and or acceptance and commitment therapy, ACT. Any of those or those in combination, which is pretty common, can be hugely beneficial in your healing. So that's what I've got for you today. We'll talk about other aspects of trauma again because it's such a huge component of our journeys. But for now, I adore you and you've got this. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of IVF This. If you like what you've heard and want to learn more, head over to ivfthiscoaching.com. That's www.ivfthiscoaching.com.